now let's let's make sense of this and see how we put it together. So I saw that 760 millimeters HG is equal to 101.3 kPa. So if I divide through by 101 kPa, so if I divide both sides by 101.3 kPa, 101.3 kPa, and this is equal to a dimensionless one. So this is a conversion factor. So this conversion factor of this over that is a dimensionless one. So I can multiply and divide by a dimensionless one. And so we're, we'll be able to use that. And what happens with vacuum is I indicated that vacuum is measured in millimeters of HG vacuum. So now let's look at a diagram and see how that plays out. So we have our pressure. I'll have P atmosphere. So P atmosphere, I'm going to have P absolute. We're going to have P vacuum. And we saw that this distance is 760 millimeters Hg. Right? So we have that one atmosphere pressure of 760 millimeters Hg. That's one atmosphere. And now for the last example that we had, we had this 500 kPa. So, so now we have 500 millimeters Hg back. And so this would be 260, oops, millimeters Hg absolute. And what I, if I want to convert this into kPa, then I can use this conversion factor. So let's look at that right now. So if I have the 260 millimeters Hg Absolutely. And I want to convert this into kPa. So I want to convert it into kPa. So I have 260 times 101.3 divided by 760, and that's going to give me 34.6 kPa. Now for homework, do 2.1, 2.7, 2.16, 2 2.17, 2.19 rather. Can't read my own handwriting. 2.19 and 2.21. So this will get you practice with this. Now one of the things I'd like to just talk about is making a barometer, or at least indicating how to do this, uh, and how how it was done. So when people measure barometric pressure, there's a barometer, maybe you've seen that in the chemistry or physics lab, and you see a tall column about 760 millimeters high of mercury, and how did they do that? And so what they did is the following, and so you're going to have to imagine this, but be that as it may. So this will be So now, imagine this is a dish that has mercury in it. So I have mercury in here. And so I have mercury in here. And now, I'm, this is going to be closed at this end. So it's a tube, like a tall test tube, except it's skinny. And I'm going to pour mercury in and fill it up. Of course, I'm going to wear gloves so I don't get mercury on my fingers, which would be bad to do. But maybe I should wear a mask too. But anyway, be that as it is. I'm going to fill it up, fill it up all the way, put your finger on it, keep your finger on it, and then put it in here. And so when I do that, when I do that, this height, ah, this height of the mercury is 760 millimeters. And as atmospheric pressure varies, 
the height of the mercury varies. So when you hear atmospheric pressure, it's being measured with a barometer like this. Now there are a couple things that uh, matter in terms of this. One of them is that if I have this barometer, so I have this thing, and I have the barometer in here, and here it is. And so I have it filled with mercury, and I have what that height is. I could have something that goes like this. Oops. And it would be at the same level. So it really doesn't matter. It does, so these are at the same level. And so it doesn't matter whether this is crooked or not. So what happens sometimes is not this is used as a model, but if I extend this a little bit and have this go out, I could have something like this. And what happens here, what happens here is I have a longer distance I can measure. So this fluid, it'll, it'll all be filled up with the fluid. But what happens is I can measure a longer distance, so then the error in measurement is less. So the, the, this we typically don't use. This we do use, particularly when measuring uh, small pressures. So small pressures like inches of water that we're interested in. Now let's look at problem 218 on page 43. Again, you can stop the, the video and go look in the book and see what it is because I'm based this on that you see that sketch and the language in there. So what we have is we're going to have something like this. And basically we have a mass, so I have this mass that's a piston. So I have a piston and it has a certain mass. We're going to have pressures. I have area one, area two, and three. And this distance is 20 centimeters. This distance is 10 centimeters. And so if I were to look at this from the top, this would be 20. This would be 10. So when I look at it from the top, I'm, we want to know why this is in static equilibrium. So it isn't falling. So if it isn't moving, that means the force is up equal to force is down. And I know that F is equal to pressure times area, and I know that the force is up equal to force is down. So I have that from static equilibrium, that it isn't moving. And this is area one. Area three is this whole diameter, and this area two is area three minus area one. So A2 is A3 minus A1. And so I have to pay attention to that. So now for static equilibrium, the, the force is up is simply pressure P3 acting here. Everything else is acting down. P1's acting down, P2's acting down, and the mass is acting down, pulled on by gravitational acceleration. So the acting up is P3 P3 a3, and acting down is mg plus p1a1 plus p2a2. What we have now is we have to pay attention to the units on this because the areas are very small. And so a3 is pi over 4 d squared pi over 4 times 
times 0 0.2 squared. So that's equal to 0 0.031416 square meters. A1, pi over 4, d squared, pi over 4, times 0 0.1 squared. And that's 0 0.20785 square meters. And A2 is the difference. So this is equal to 0 0.02356. And Mg, Mg over 1,000 is going to give me kilonewtons. And so I have 21 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by 1,000 newtons per kilonewton. And so I'll have that mg is equal to 0 0.2058 kilonewtons. And if I solve for P3, so substitute in the, the pressures that were given, that you're given that P1 was equal to 600 kPa, and P2 was 170 kPa. So you multiply all that stuff out, and you'll get that P3 is equal to 284 kPa. This wraps up what we're talking about with pressure. There's a little bit of piece on temperature that I wanted to talk about, and I'm talking about how we can use a thermometer uh, to measure temperature. So that's, that's what we're looking at. The final definition of temperature occurs later in the text in, in terms of defining it as a property. In this case, temperature is defined in terms of other properties, but later on we'll define it in terms of its own right. So we have something called the quality of temperature. So we cannot define T, but we can say the following. When two objects are in thermal equilibrium, there is no change in any observable properties. In any observable And so if I now pretend that the straw is a thermometer so now I have the straws or thermometer. It's a little crooked because it's a bent straw for my grandkids. But anyway, be that as it may, I have this thermometer ah, in my mouth. So I put it in my mouth. I could pretend to put it in my mouth. And so what happens is that the thermometer changes. The, the density of the fluid in there changes. And when it no longer changes, it says that this thermometer is in thermal equilibrium with my mouth. And that enables me to tell the temperature. And so the zeroth law So the zeroth law of thermodynamics says when two bodies In thermal equilibrium with the third, the 
they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. And at the same temperature. So what? The, so what this zeroth law means? So if I have um, two bodies, so I'll have a person here, and I'll have another person over here, and that could be. This person could be here, this person could be in China, Japan, wherever. And then if I have a thermometer, right? so if I have a thermometer and I measure my temperature and it says that it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and I use the same thermometer there, and this person has 98.6, we can say that we both have 98.6. And so this third thing enables us to measure in different different areas, different parts. So it's not specific to me in a given location. And so for homework related to this, 234 and 236. 